Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending where, of course, you're joining us from. Welcome to Adeon Science Park's Going Global a USA version. My name is Neil Greenspan, and I am sending this to you live from Lund, Sweden, from Adeon Science Park, the first science park in the world to be a part of the United Nations Global Compact. My name is Neil Greenspan. I've, I'm an American, and I've lived and worked in Sweden for almost 17 years now, of which the last six or seven have been quite active around the Dion Science Park in the Swedish startup and innovation ecosystem. And I'm really happy to be the moderator on today's Going, Glo going Global call. Um, so the U.S. market, for those startups out there thinking of going, taking their product or service to the U.S., the U.S. kind of is seen as the holy grail of markets, or is it? We think that after today, you're going to have some questions uh, during the day that need to be answered. And hopefully, through the great panelists that we have in line for you, you're going to be able to get lots of those questions answered. The panel of experts comes from three different parts of the, the Swedish ecosystem that, that help startups around the world, the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce, Nordic Innovation House, both in New York and in Silicon Valley, as well as Business Sweden. We have three companies who, three Swedish companies who have gone through the process of, and are still going through the process of taking their product or service to the American market. And then we have a venture capitalist who, though he's sitting in Norway today, has extensive experience in the American market. And I think he's gonna give some information that you'll find super interesting. A special thanks to all of the panelists who've joined us today, especially to those on the West Coast. We know it's just after 6 a.m. there, and for most of us, that's quite early. Um, as far as questions go, please feel free to write down your questions in, in the chat. We will be following them. I'll try to keep up with them. My lovely assistants here, who you can't see, will be keeping up with them as well, and we'll try to answer them at, at the most appropriate time that we can. If your question is specific, to one of our panelists, please specify that. Some of our panelists, unfortunately, won't be able to stay on the entire time. What I'm going to ask those panelists to do is please put your email address, if it's okay, in the chat so that people can follow up with you directly. I think it'll be a really valuable way to connect. So at this point, I would like to introduce our first panel. And that this panel consists of three people. And unfortunately, one of them has not been able to make it. We hope that hopefully he, he pops in. Um, but the two people who are on with us are Emma Friedwall, who is the Chief Operating Officer and Business Services Lead at the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce in New York, and Therese Clausen, who works for Business Sweden and is located in San Francisco. So good morning to you both. And um, Emma Emma's going to start us off with a presentation about the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce. And as I said, please feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat. Take it away, Emma. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you that are in Sweden, uh, thank you so much for having me today. I'm thrilled to be here and to speak with you all about the US market and opportunities for Swedish startups and scale-ups. Um, and I would like to start by asking you all a few questions and you can just answer them by raising your hand in Zoom. They're mainly for your own purposes. First of all, I'd like to know how many of you are planning to enter the US market in the next couple of years? Have you secured enough capital to fund your expansion? Have you identified your US customers and competitors? Do you currently have an understanding of your local customers' problems? Do you currently have a pitch deck that is tailored for the US market? Have you talked to an attorney to establish potential legal implications of launching your business in the US? Christina. The reason I ask all these questions is because they are all essential parts of a US launch and are areas in which many Scandinavian startups often don't dedicate the necessary resources to succeed. And this is where organizations such as SAC New York can be of a huge help. And it's our goal to bridge the gap between Swedish innovation and the US market. And when entering a new market, the most important thing is to understand why and how you're doing it. 
you need to pinpoint your local target customer and understand what their problem is and how your solution is uniquely equipped to help them solve that problem. You also need to understand local challenges and the specific needs of the customers locally, not to mention the local requirements of you as a business. And before we dig into how SAC New York can support you in your US launch, let's briefly touch on the market potential for Swedish companies here. What is Sweden's competitive edge? So as I'm sure some of you know, uh, Swedes are highly regarded by Americans, which is great. And the interest in Swedish innovation is in fact growing. My team and I conducted a study at the end of 2020 in which we found that despite Sweden's uh, controversial COVID approach, 9% of US companies report an increased interest in Swedish industry and enterprises today as compared to before the outbreak of the pandemic, which is great. Sweets are considered more sustainable, more innovative, and more reliable as compared to before the COVID outbreak. And with, with all of this said, there is much interest in Swedish innovation that you as a business leader should capitalize on. One area in which Swedes are especially high regarded is within the field of sustainability where we are considered to be at the global forefront. There is now a rapidly growing interest in and demand for sustainable business approaches and solutions among US companies as compared to just a year ago, which is great news for Sweden and, and obviously the planet as well. And why enter the US market now? Why, why is now a good time? So even though the pandemic has given rise to travel and visa restrictions that have prevented many Swedes from physically coming to New York and the rest of the US, it has contributed with some silver linings that are beneficial for international companies. There are of course certain aspects that make business more difficult, but at the same time, there is a full behavioral shift where people are becoming much more comfortable with making strategic decision, decisions remotely. And we see this even more in the US than in Sweden, as there has been a much stricter lockdown here. So people have had to adopt to a greater extent. And when it comes to client meetings and meetings with investors and the likes, decisions are now more likely to be reached online than ever before. And this will most certainly have long-term consequences and be a positive trend for an entrepreneur from a country like Sweden, as it will be easier to enter a new market remotely. And in terms of location, so of course, what location you select in the US or which locations depend on multiple factors, including which industry you're in and where there is demand for your product or service. So it's super important to do proper market research here. But generally speaking, there are many advantages of focusing on the East Coast for Swedish companies. For instance, New York City is the largest city in the country and has the nation's biggest customer base. Most major corporations are headquartered in New York or at the very least have some type of presence here. So when looking for potential business partners or similar, being located in the same city and understanding that culture to the fullest is very helpful. Time difference, this is a big one. So the Swedish workday overlaps with New York's workday, which LA's workday does not. So it's a six hour versus a nine hour time difference, which, which is quite a big difference if you as a company have internal meetings and the likes uh, and long-term it's just very helpful to at least have three hours where you can work with, with your team. In addition to all of this, there are many unique opportunities for different sectors in New York. As an example, Sweet then has a lot of incredible innovation within clean tech, <clears throat> excuse me. And New York State offers grants to companies that can help build a greener future for New York. And even though you're not in this specific field, it's very possible that there are similar opportunities for you and your sector if you do a little research. So now, how can SAC New York help you in, in your journey? First, I'd like to briefly touch on who we are for those of you that are not familiar. 
So we're the largest and oldest Swedish Chamber of Commerce globally. And we've supported Swedish businesses looking to establish and thrive on the US market for close to 115 years. So as a result of that, we have an incredible network of uh, companies and both of you know, big scale and, and smaller startups and scale ups. And even though we're the oldest chamber, we have a modernized mission to act as an indispensable support arm for internationalizing Swedish entrepreneurship and innovation. And as a result of that, we launched a co-working platform and innovation hub named Gateway, which is where I'm sitting and working from today. Um, and we did this just a couple of years back. And our goal with this space is to provide Swedish and Nordic businesses a unique soft landing and launch platform onto the US market. So if you're in need of office space or conference rooms with on-site market and establishment expertise and services, Gateway would be a great option for you. And in addition to all of this and of most relevance to you right now and your businesses, we host acceleration programs and have other services that we provide to our members that could be very helpful. And to just briefly circle back to the questions that I asked in the beginning, all of these are areas in which SAC New York actively supports startups and scale-ups. And typically we do this through our digital acceleration programs, which we tailor to the participating companies and host throughout the year. And in these programs, we will support you with anything from market research to pitch training to business and investor matchmaking and much more. Thank you guys so much for, for listening in to me today. I, I sadly believe that this is all the time we have. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about how we support Swedish growth companies like yours, I'd be happy to, to hop on a call. So you'll see my email in, in the PowerPoint presentation. So just send out an email and either myself or someone on my team would be happy to schedule a meeting. Thank you so much. Great presentation, Emma. Thank you so much for giving us that information on the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce and what you can do for Swedish startups looking to go to, to get into the American market. Uh, our next presenter, unfortunately, wasn't able to be with us today. He was representing the Nordic Innovation House in New York. But for those of you who are interested in the Nordic Innovation House, we do have somebody from Nordic Innovation House, Silicon Valley, who will be joining us later. So that means the next person up on our agenda comes from an organization called Business Sweden. She is located in San Francisco, so it's not even 6.30 a.m. there, her time. I would like to, I would like to welcome Therese Clausen, who will talk a little bit about what Business Sweden could do for you. Welcome, Therese. Um, so I have a quite short agenda for today um, that I would like to present for you. So I can say that I first would like to introduce myself and why I am relevant for this seminar. Then I would like to go through a bit, what is Business Sweden and what kind of support we actually offer to startups and scale-ups looking to come to the US or to anywhere else in the world. And then I'm also gonna go through um, what you should consider as a start or scale up when you're approaching US investors. So quickly about myself, uh, I have a very little background and been working in consulting for quite many years in Europe, and not so much in Sweden actually, even though I'm Swedish. Um, and I've also been supporting startups and scale ups on the side of my work where my clients have been primarily American uh, startups mostly out from university accelerators. So I have quite a lot of experience when it comes to US startups, less experience when it comes to Nordic and Swedish startups. So what services does Business Sweden offer to Swedish startups and scale-ups? If we just go through briefly what Business Sweden is, so we're an organization that is partly owned by the Swedish government and partly uh, private. And we have two sides of the business. One side we do trade, and that's when we're helping Swedish companies 
to export to foreign markets. We also do invest where we have American or foreign companies to import uh, to Sweden. We have 43 offices in 39 countries, and we are divided into seven ecosystem, where I assume maybe this session would be mostly about digital tech, maybe also life science, I'm not really sure. And we help companies to primarily do either market, market expansion services, which are for Swedish companies, and we also help them to find partners and other kind of key stakeholders abroad that would be that would make their expansion much, much easier if you would like to pilot or demo your product with a US partner, for instance. So what kind of programs do we have at Business Sweden that would support startups or scale ups? So I think actually all of our programs are subsidized by the government uh, that are turning to Swedish starting scale-ups. So first off, we have something called Leap Accelerator, and that's a quite short uh, program, which is basically accelerating a company's growth, um, where you would meet uh, investors and uh, customers to kind of amend your product for the market. The second stage of that is the Catalyst. That's an accelerated program for three months, which is focused on commercialization. So it's basically we're helping you to understand the market that is abroad. So the foreign market, so for instance, US. So if you would go to the Catalyst program, you would probably work together with someone in Sweden and someone in the US with the possibility to come to the US and either meet the partners or meet the stakeholders or other individuals that would be very important for your product. And we do that because we think it's very important that when a company is a little bit older and very mature for, a, for scaling, it should be very natural to somehow understand the foreign customer and the foreign partner. That's why we also offer these kind of meet and greet with the um, with the exporting market. Then we have the similar program called Try Swedish, which is like Catalyst, but it's more focused on food and beverage companies. And we also have an export program um, that is for SMEs, so it's the larger stage of um, uh, scale ups. So what, you should, what should you consider when you're meeting US investors? It's a quite interesting question because as I previously said, I don't really have too much experience with um, Swedish startups, but what I can say, um, let's um, just trying to find my document here, but I can't even access my, Um, there we go. Okay. Um, and what I can say when you're meeting investors is that uh, US investors um, is that before entering US, you really need to have Swedish investors behind you. You can't come without any kind of external funding uh, to the US. So you need to have Swedish money behind you. Also keep in mind, when you're coming to the US, everything's much more expensive and you also get kind of much more money when you're asking for it. So to raise, for instance, 5 million USD, it's a bit of a hassle. It's much better to raise 50 million USD and it's much more to the point as well. And if you're saying, for instance, that you're kind of, you know, con conquering the world with your services and your products, then 50 million USD is a much better choice than 5 million USD. It could also be a very good option to actually incorporate in the US when you come to meet US investors. Also because um, the US, um, uh, also because the US um, regulations 
investors know that. They know that 80% of companies are incorporated in Delaware. So they also would like to invest in that kind of company that would be incorporated in Delaware. So it could be something to consider when you want to enter the US actually and, and approach US investor to also incorporate. Another thing that you should think about when meeting US investors is to be very well prepared with your material, just as the Chamber of New York stated. So you have to have your pitch deck and you need to have an executive summary that you can share with the investors. And keep in mind that the pitch deck needs to be a pitch deck and not a presentation. Uh, because I've seen so many pitch deck from Swedish companies that have really been a 20 page presentation with too much information that I don't even myself <laughs> have the time or um, energy to read through everything. And I know that it's so easy to be carried away when you're presenting your, uh, your product or your service that you're so passionate about, but you need to be clear about what problem the company is solving to make sure that the investor or whoever is listening to you understand why your company is different and to understand what the value is of your company. So that is, don't spend 20 minutes describing the technology that you have developed Talk instead about how you're addressing the market and why and how the technology has added value. Keep in mind that investors, they would like to know also how they can get the best return on their investment. So try to have that angle as well, because you will for sure have a lot of those questions. Then something I've also seen from looking at team, uh, from pitch decks um, is that when you're presenting the page on team members, which is a super important page, then make sure to have maximum three or four people on this pitch deck. You shouldn't include the entire team, just take the ones that are vital to the company, the ones that you can't exchange to someone else or for someone else. And when you're meeting an investor for the first time, don't do group meet meetings at any point. The first time it should be one person. The second meeting, it should be two person. Never more than three people, I would say. And the last point is very uh, important as well. If you have a technology or if you have something that has its own value, if it wouldn't, wouldn't be copied, then you have to have an IP and you have to own the IP. And the investor is very curious to know if you're actually owning your own IP. I wish you the best of success for maybe entering the US market. And I'm always here at Business Sweden in San Francisco to give you some support or ask or help you with any questions that you would like uh, for me to answer. See you. Great, thank you very much, Therese, for your presentation. I do know from working with Business Sweden here in Southern Sweden that they also offer um, help with your pitch deck. So to Therese's final points, if you're not sure, reach out to Business Sweden, even here in Sweden, and they can help you out so that when you send it to Therese in the United States, she gets exactly what she thinks will help you guys get the investment that you're looking for. So I do have a question at this point from uh, Clara Norell posted it, and she is saying thank you for a great seminar, which I think we can all uh, agree with. Um, she's curious to hear more about joint ventures to set up business deals, collaborative contracts, and what to think of. In the LEAP program, would the legal procedures of such be covered? And I'm guessing this is geared a little bit more towards Therese. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so all of these questions, you will actually uh, get support and you will also be addressed your own mentor. So if you get into the LEAP program, even, you know, kind of questions regarding tax, uh, what you think about when it comes to um, uh, agreements with, with investors, you will get support on all of that. It's like an overall help program. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Therese. Um, Emma, do you maybe have any, uh, certainly not of the specific LEAP program, but do you have any information maybe about that particular question from Clara? 
Hi, so in terms of this type of support, what I think makes us uniquely positioned to be able to answer these types of questions is that, you know, our incredible network will always have someone that can respond to them. So if this is a question about joint ventures, if we are hosting um, an acceleration program where this specific group is interested in that field, we will bring in an expert and host a workshop within that field, if that makes sense. So we will be able to, to answer the questions that the specific group that we work with will be interested in hearing the answers to. So we, we, we do our programs a little differently, I think, than Team Sweden um, in the sense that they're specifically tailored. They're not as standardized. OK, that's great. Emma, before you mute yourself again, because uh, we do have a few more minutes before our next speaker. Uh, I have a question that, Emma, you can feel free to answer first, and then we'll go to Therese. And this is, how do I find business partners? So I think, um, and I think uh, Therese will, will um, agree with me here, uh, that is, there's no like one size fits all answer to that question. It all depends on, you know, what sector you're in and so on and what network you have access to. Something that we have found incredibly helpful is, you know, to, to reach out to your current existing network and see, do you have someone that might be in touch with a business partner that you're interested in reaching out to? Especially in the US, having some sort of reference is incredibly valuable. And this is something that we work with uh, a lot with our member companies. We do have uh, a business matchmaking program where we work one-on-one -on -one with companies and have them tell us about what type of potential business partners are they interested in meeting and we will look within our network to see if we have a profile that matches that and then we'll sort of work on that list together to to schedule those meetings and make those contacts great thanks for that information emma therese do you have any information to to, to share about that question sure. and i can also put on my camera hi there <laughs> um yeah, so in uh, so one of uh, our services is in Business Sweden is actually partner search. Uh, and then we basically distill down. Um, sorry? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> oh. um, and then we basically distill down um, a long list uh, until a short list of potential partners. Uh, that we could do introductions uh, to you for, depending on what your uh, what your ask is. Uh, but that's uh, included in, in actually in all of our um, startup and scale up um, programs to do some kind of either high level or deep analysis of partner search. Yeah. Great, thanks very much, Therese. So Charles has been able to join us now. We only have about a minute left before our next presenter. Charles, do you want to just make a, a quick introduction of yourself and what Nordic Innovation House is about? You have about a minute and five seconds. Thank you for having me. Um, we help Nordic startups and scale-ups when they're coming to the US market, uh, primarily as a first point of contact. We clear up some confusion about uh, the different service providers and, and what the ecosystem here looks like. Um, and, and also with specific tech sector information, we have programs on specific areas like prop tech, uh, women innovation. Uh, we have a big conference tomorrow um, for women innovation uh, and uh, and other esports, uh, fintech stuff like that. Um, so if you're if if it looks a little daunting when coming to the U.S. market, which tends to be very large, uh, we can help as as a as a starting point for that. And then we work very closely with Business Sweden, so we're effectively a service of Business Sweden um, for uh, tech startups and scale ups. Um, and so we have a really good relationship with them. Um, effectively, you know, our, our raison d'etre is that um, with the, it's better to combine forces to get more attention from investors uh, and uh, partners and potential customers in the U.S. market because it is so large um, and because the, the Nordics as a, as a region um, tend to have greater numbers when they combine forces between the countries. So that is really the big advantage with Nordic Innovation House. 
Okay, great. Charles, I, uh, I'd love to have more, more time with you. If you can stick around, maybe there'll be some time a little bit later on to ask you some questions and, and touch base with you again. But now we need Absolutely. to move on to the next point in our agenda, which is our first testimonial of the day. And our, it's, this is from a company called Surstech, and the presenter is Johan Ranicki, who is the sales officer of Surtech which is founded in 2006 and has been publicly listed since 2016. Surstech is a solutions-oriented company based in Lund, Sweden, offering products and services to maximize chemical intelligence. Johan will share Surstech's experience on entering the U.S. market and lessons learned from the journey. Please, Johan, give us your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. And, uh... You saved me a couple of the uh, sentences, so that's thank you for that. Uh, happy to be here and uh, present uh, Sastex's uh, journey from uh, going global. Uh, first of all, uh, sharing some uh, background, uh, Sastex is a company manufacturing handheld Raman devices, so truly handheld devices such as this for chemical threat identification. So any kind of narcotic. Uh, explosive or uh, toxic uh, industrial compound can be scanned and identified uh, with our devices. So our target groups are uh, global uh, law enforcement, so police organizations, uh, prisons, uh, could be uh, airport securities, could be uh, army, military, uh, firefighters, uh, safety and rescue teams and uh, also pharmaceutical companies and lab companies. So we have a quite uh, wide group of end users, even though we are qu quite small in our uh, solution. Uh, our headquarter is, uh, yes, based in Lund. Uh, all our products are fully designed, developed and manufactured in Sweden. So how did we do our expansion? How did we go global? I would like to share with you uh, just some uh, insights uh, in that, uh, some findings, uh, maybe some lessons learned, uh, and also uh, some successes from our side. So first of all, what strategy? Do we have a defined strategy? What we need to ask ourselves why to go global? Why to enter US? Is it because of building market presence? Is it building brand, like brand awareness? Or is it, well, maybe most likely, getting sales? Is it long-term sales, short-term sales? So those things we need to have answering on. If it's about building market presence, then of course we need to make sure to have quality over time. We all know how long time it takes to build a good reputation, but we can ruin it over a day if we don't have the right uh, uh, kind of product or solution. Also, we need to understand how shall we do this? Who is our target groups? Who is our competitors? Yeah. How shall we differentiate ourselves? Are we going with direct sales? Then of course we need the manpower for that. Are we doing channel sales? How to do with marketing? So of course there are many things that we need answers on before just going there. So make sure to have the strategy in place. What we did in the very beginning, uh, we started out 2006, and uh, yes, we are very much into innovation, product development. Uh, so we did going in the commercial phase like 2018. Uh, myself joined the company in the beginning of 2018. So very soon I found out that, well, we truly need to have a CRM or a sales uh, system tools in place because keeping track of data is highly key. And also, if the data is there, everything is visible. 
it isn't okay to just uh, work aside on some Excel documents. So we need to have the data visible. We need to keep track on the data. Everything from prospecting, everything from uh, contacts, leads, opportunities, and all our accounts. Traceability and keeping track on our progress. So that is a highly recommendation. Make sure you have a good proper system in place. What we also need to do is to identify our end customers and our key targets. Who are they? How to reach out to them? If working with channel sales, where to find them? Who is the best partners to have? So we need to work very effective with prospecting. What is our value proposition? And for the market, in this case, US, what should be our key values for entering the market? How to compete with the competition? Do we need any certain features? Do we need any specific uh, certifications? In our case, it's very much about military standard from shock and vibration. It needs to be waterproof. Uh, we need to have FDA regulations. So we need to understand how can we compete on the right terms? What differs us from the others? Should we have any uh, special concepts? In our case, we have launched a couple of different concepts. Uh, the latest one, rental. So we are trying to be industry first to rent out, even though it's a very expensive solution. So try to find out what kind of concepts could we bring to the market to make us unique. The big value for us is our channel sales. So we don't do any direct sales. We could do it, but then of course we need to identify every end user and make sure that we really understands about all markets, all different uh, counties, because decisions are made in many times locally. So for us, a big, big value is the channel. Uh, how to create a market present, how to build the brand awareness. This is so important for us we identified very early close corporations. So we work very close with the National Forensic Center, Swedish Defense Research Agency. We work very close with uh, universities around, uh, especially Lund. We work very close with uh, global uh, police uh, organizations to make sure that they provide us information. What is important in your country, in your region, in terms of the hazardous substances and so on. So we make sure to identify important and uh, good uh, organizations for us to uh, uh, join with. Also, try to identify industry influencers. Who are the influencers in our area? What kind of events, what kind of exhibitions should we join to get out there? Building the, the brand awareness, establishing market presence. Should we do any ad in any kind of prints or any magazines? Most likely we should have a LinkedIn account. I'm not that uh, very much into social media, but LinkedIn is a very powerful tool in the business side. So having an account, make sure to be active, do posts, follow different groups within your industry and your interest. Make sure to invite, enter a group, make sure to invite all those relevant persons within. And once you have them as a person, make sure they follow your website. Do direct messages over LinkedIn. Most of the people within the industry, they are within LinkedIn. So send them a direct message. 
ask them. The worst thing you can get is a no. And then we have account development. This has become so important for us to make sure that we have the right partners on board because spending a year in a territory with the wrong partner, that will cost you a lot. So then we need to understand, okay, how to measure our partners in hand, how to develop them, what are the key triggers? For certain, they need training. Should we come up with a learning management system or should we just provide them with some PowerPoints or should we do uh, online sessions? We for sure also need to make sure that they have the right kind of marketing material, brochures, videos, testimonials, success stories, everything they need to be successful because they are our feet on the ground. If we don't have the right partners, we will waste time and we will not find the revenue for that market. So very important, identify the weak spots. We need to make sure, are we really covering all areas? Do we cover law enforcement? And within law enforcement, we have narcotic investigation, we have bomb squads, we have traffic police, we have border police, and so on. We need to make sure that our partners understand about all this. Also, do we have any blank spots? If they're not covering, then we need to find a new partner. So what I'm saying is prospecting, prospecting, prospecting. Always make sure that you have the right partners on board. And maybe they need to overlap. Maybe we need to evaluate more than one at a time. And then of course we need to have something like uh, project protection or uh, some kind of policy to make sure that they are not interfering because we need to make sure we have happy partners on board. So focus, focus, focus. From our perspective, uh, we started out and uh, I hired people uh, based here in Lund and uh, we said, well, now we want to uh, seize the world. Now we should go out there. Lessons learned after like maybe one and a half year was that, and especially when uh, COVID hit us, we cannot travel. There are so many restrictions in place. How can we go around that? And then by end of this year, we realized that we should have local people on board. So what we did then was to reach out to our uh, partnerships, to our uh, uh, contacts in each and all regions to understand, do they have any uh, kind of uh, uh, impact or uh, understanding? Uh, could they uh, propose any person? So once we have identified uh, some key persons, we actually hired them on a consultant basis to begin with, because then we had uh, SaaS tech people with the cap on uh, in the local market, uh, directly working and uh, developing our uh, prospects, our accounts, our partners, and also our end customers in some cases. So for me, going global, uh, you really need to understand the end market. You really need to understand your customers, your partners in hand. And the best way of doing that is to have the local presence. With that local presence, you can truly build the brand awareness, uh, the market presence, and generate the long-term sales. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan, for that very comprehensive and detailed presentation. I think the startups out there learned quite a lot from uh, from the presentation, and we were all cheering you on in the room here. We thought we we thought it was excellent the way you went through everything. 
and you took the whole 15 minutes. So I didn't have to write down any questions to ask you, but certainly please stick around in case there are some questions if you're free and we can take that later. If you have any specific questions for Johan, feel free to write them in the chat or Johan, if you can't stick around and it's okay for them to reach out to you, feel free to put your email address in, in the chat. I will leave my email address. I will stay for a while and please, you're, happy, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and I, we can have a one-on-one -on -one and I will share more information. Great. Thank you so much, Johan. Thank you. Okay. Our next part on the agenda is another testimonial from a Loon startup called Zaplox. And the person who will be representing Zaplox today is Pranilla, Pranilla Broad. She is the Zaplox CMO, CMO and responsible for Zaplox Global Partnerships and share the insights on why Zaplox partner strategy has helped the company extend their U.S. footprint. A little bit about Zaplox is that they offer mobile check-in and mobile keys to the hospitality industry in Europe and North America. The company has established and grown their U.S. business by mixing direct sales with selling through their continuously growing partner network. Please welcome Pranilla. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I'm going to start my presentation here. All right. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm, uh, I want to also actually say thank you to Johan for a really, really good presentation. Um, I, I think that some of the key points that you made, um, I have, um, and Southbox, really experienced. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Sablox is a, the provider of a mobile guest journey. Um, we've been around for, for quite some time. We started in uh, 2010. And uh, as Neil said, I'm the um, CMO and responsible for Sablox Global Partnership. I'm located here in Lund. Um, and um, the company right now actually is located in Ideon Gateway uh, on the 14th floor. So we have a um, astonishing view uh, over Lund and even so far as to Copenhagen actually, uh, looking at the airports uh, and wondering when we can start travel again, as we are in hospitality industry. Uh, we are the market innovator of uh, the mobile guest journey and the mobile key services. Um, and we have had commercial installations in, since 2011. We are listed on NASDAQ. Uh, and we have, as I said, an office here in Lund, but we also have an office in New York. So we uh, work on the North American market and European market. That, those are our core markets. Uh, in our team, we are about 19 people and uh, we are um, located with the most of the people in, in Sweden, uh, but we work of course in both markets as we are a SaaS company. So we deploy our solutions um, uh, through our SaaS solutions, so which means that we don't need to be um, at the so at the specific um, location to deploy our solutions. Um, we have um, I've been invited to work about to talk about the strategic partnerships and how we work with them. Um, and but first, before I do that, I'm going to um, present very shortly on what we do to make you understand how we. Um, what type of products we actually brought to the market in US uh, many years ago. It's like four years ago, three, five years ago now. Um, so um, it is a contactless guest solution. We work with uh, offering through our partners and ourselves in direct sales, a, a mobile check-in, mobile checkout with mobile keys. Uh, we offer them in app solution, in a kiosk solution, and we offer them also as an integratable SDK solution to our partners to deploy themselves. So that's what we do. Our target group is hotels and casinos and resorts in Europe and in North America. So that's what laid the ground for you. Uh, contact free technology, I think you've heard a lot about it. Right now, it is really something that has changed the hotel industry. It is changing it. We are part of the digital transformation. We've been working uh, in, the U in the US market for quite some time now. And we actually see that um, as it's been um, a couple of years ago when we started talking about the mobile um, and the contactless, 
I think that from a traditional perspective on the hotel industry, uh, many were a bit afraid that you would lose the personal service by actually asking the guest to use their phone to check in and to get their key and to even check out and maybe communicate with the hotel during their stay. Today, it's such a different story, right? We are still in a pandemic. We have had a year, 2020, was a year where uh, the hotel industry suffered a lot. Um, many hotels have been either closed or they have had very, very low occupancy. The guests has really don't, they haven't been there. They haven't been traveling. And we have been, many of us, confined into actually our homes. And, and um, so our hotels are uh, struggling, but we've seen such a difference between the US market and the European market. The US market has taken upon this pandemic in a, in a sort of different way. Uh, and they have actually kept their hotels open during 2020, most of them, most of the hotels have been open. The hotels that has been in um, uh, the mountains, um, on the resorts, seasides, uh, beaches, you know, resorts, larger ones, and casinos have kept open and have had really, really high occupancy. Of course, focusing on the health and the safety, guest safety, as um, requirements that um, the government has set up. But that has been a very positive experience for Saplox because we have done the best year ever in our history during 2020. So uh, the quarter two, three and four has really um, been very, very positive for us in the US market. The hoteliers are choosing a contactless guest journey right now. So I'm moving forward. I, I'm here to talk about our Saplox network. And what we tried out from the beginning, of course, and we still do, is to do direct sales on the US, US market. One of the experiences we had, we are a small company. And um, in order to work in together with a a uh, business and industry that is very traditional, it is difficult to be in distance. You need to be have feet on the ground and you need to be there to have the conversations directly face to face. We felt that a good idea forward there was to actually connect to partners, to work with partnerships that also included the technology part, but also gave a possibility for the, techno te um, the technology partner to uh, also sell for, you know, on the behalf of Saplox. So we created a partner network, a structure that is, has three steps. So as a partner, uh, when you sort of start your partnership together with Saplox, you, uh, we often start with an integration and that's step one. Um, we often go for, forward to um, number two, which is, and that's in a, in a year or so, when we have established our joint technology and we have an integration ready to be promoted. Um, we often um, move forward to um, the step two, which is when we start together marketing our joint solution and we, we work commercially in cooperation to promote solutions in the market. Uh, and we, of course, generate prospects together as well. To be, to be very, very sort of, this is not always a year between, it could be a month between, because it all depends on which type of technical solution, of course. So, um, and then uh, the third step for us is integration, uh, of course, um, it's always the base and sales and marketing. So this is where we actually share our solution with the partner and the partner themselves uh, take upon them to sell, sell and market the solution, including our, for instance, mobile keys or um, a check-in solution. 
So the advantages for our uh, partner network right now in US is that, of course, the partner network opened doors for us. They accelerate sales um, with the structure I just mentioned. Of course, a positive part is that they, um, the, the network sell our solutions. Um, and it is a proven solution as the integration has been done together with the partner and they have references connected to them. Um, the solutions that our partner provides and what we provide in the market is also a natural extension of the existing uh, product from the partner. And that is a great value. In a traditional industry as we work in, this is a very important part because there needs to be logic and there needs to be something that follows a, a good flow. That's important within hoteliers because their foremost and focus is to give the guest the best service ever. And there need to be nothing that would sort of um, interfere with that service flow. Um, today, our partner network, it has grown uh, very rapidly over the last years. Um, and um, we have 40% of the total market for PMS. That's the business um, um, systems for hoteliers. That's property management systems. And over 70% of the total market for lock systems. Um, and that is locks, hotel locks like um, Asab, Lloyd, or Macaba, and, and Salto. I, I don't know, you've probably seen them on, on um, any door close to you. Um, and this network that we work in is, of course, a sort of glue into our presence in the market. It gives SAP locks a strong market footprint in the US market without having to grow ourselves sort of in, in uh, manpower but also establish uh, an office in each and every state. So, right, moving forward. Um, there is some of our um, partners. I'm not gonna go through them. This is just a, a, an image of, see of, of the global market leading hospitality uh, partners that we work with. Um, and of course, uh, we are currently adding more partners to our uh, network. Um, this is one of our stronger focused for SAPLOX during 2021. So taking the partner route to US, here is my last slide of um, some ideas and, and thoughts and lessons learned and everything that all the mistakes done. Um, evaluate potential partners based on your company's overall object objective, sales goals, market strategy. I know uh, that Joan was, uh, was touching on this uh, in, in more detail than I'm doing now, but I can just confirm, yes, so important. Be sure why you're doing this. Why are you doing this? How are you gonna do it? And in, with what um, actions and measures do you have the possibility to do this? Because it's easy to take on a giant project and then halfway through you, you sort of see it's not possible. Um, be ready to be vetted by the potential partner. Hey, they will lift on every lid, open every cupboard to um, get the insights on your company and on your solutions. Um, be be um, forthcoming with um, what you want from your partnership. That's very important. What, what is the, what's your interest of this partnership? It's nice that you're good friends, but be, be very clear on that. Um, multiple discovery calls. Uh, I know it's really um, sort of a simple thing to say, but I, my experience is that the first call, it, it's like dating, right? So you get all the nice, lovely wordings for the first two calls and everyone's really nice to each other. And then you continue to be nice to each other, but you also get to know each other and you open up a bit more. So uh, a couple of our at least more multiple discovery calls is good. Very important is connect multiple company contacts and channels with the por um, potential partner. Uh, it doesn't work with just having one person from your company or two persons working um, together with your partner. You need to feel that there is a lot of uh, different 
ex, uh, entrances into the partner community. So it needs to be um, sales, it needs to be um, customer success, it needs to be development, it needs to be um, CEO, it needs to be uh, the person's work with, with selling um, small parts of your solution. It's the hardware of people. You know, the better way to get a partnership to work is to have uh, many people connecting with many people within the partner. Um, that's very important. That makes the glue. Um, and uh, when you do have partnership and you are looking into really wanting to, to go to market with that partnership, you should be very quick on putting together a joint market message and uh, create and communicate that because that creates the stickiness of your partnership. Um, and that is ex especially very important if you are partnering with a larger market leader in the US. So if you look at sort of from Saplogs with a small company um, teaming up with larger market leading um, PMS vendors, this is very important for us. Be sure you have legal documentation. Um, don't go for the standards. Um, work with something, legal contracts that is connected to your solution, your industry. Um, don't do templates, no shortcuts. And then we have the um, objectives and the product and technical documentation, everything that Joanne just mentioned. So. That's it. Thank you very much, Pernilla. That was a, also a very interesting journey and congratulations to Zaplox. Zaplox was one of the companies that kind of started as I started to get going here at a DN Science Park and it's been really fun and interesting to follow your journey. So well done in the middle of a pandemic to have your best, best year ever. And we look forward to seeing more great things from you guys in the future as well. Moving right along to our next point on the agenda, we have our resident uh, venture capitalist, our the one investor on the panel today, and I think people will find this interesting. So Arna Tonig is, will be talking to us. Arna is a venture capitalist at Alliance Venture. Arna has 10 years track record focused on value creation, resulting from build, building great high growth companies, specializing in deep tech and growth through market expansion. Arna will, give, Arna will give us a perspective from a venture capitalist's point of view on going into the US market. Welcome, Arna. Hi, hi everyone. Great to be here and thanks for inviting me to come along. Um, let's see, I'll just put up my deck here uh, and hopefully that will... Can everyone see my deck? Let me know if, if you can. So uh, just a short background. I'm a partner at Alliance Venture. We're a Nordic venture capital firm investing in digital tech companies in early stage. So that's typically what we call seed rounds and series A rounds um, based out of currently Oslo and Stockholm. Uh, but I've spent five years in California at Nordic Innovation House as being the investor in residence, simply because some of our core thesis is that uh, growth comes through market expansion uh, when you're from a small home market. So I've been very actively working with companies expanding into the U US market uh, and also uh, been a mentor at programs for startups at Nordic Innovation House in, in Silicon Valley. And what I was asked to, to talk about today was an investor perspective on what should I do when first, uh, do first when considering entering the UK, US market. And so that's what I will uh, sort of, uh, talk about the key question, what should I do first when considering entering the U uh, US market? <clears throat> that is a hard question to answer simply because it's very context specific to the company. So I'll try to sort of uh, share a little bit of general learnings and experiences that I've seen with the companies I work with. And I think the first and generic question is to answer why? Uh, entering the US, uh, US market, uh, you should be very clear on why you're doing that and what objectives you're, you're, uh, you're looking for, because that's the key to executing in, in the right way. And, and therefore, I think that's the most important question of all to, to do it. And, and if you start looking at, at the whys, 
I think there's only one overarching uh, and generically correct answer to the why. And that is that there is a segment of customers where you can uniquely serve them with whatever your value proposition is. And I think that should be the generic and universal starting point. And, uh, and where you should have very good uh, answers to that before you start executing on, on anything. Um, there are a couple of, of secondarily uh, whys as to why you should be in the US market. One could be learning, although that's not uh, entirely in entering the market, but it's maybe good uh, to spend time there learning before you actually get to an entry point where after you've decided to, to go there. And that's part of what we've uh, worked with in market validation at, at Nordic Innovation House. And secondarily, even if you don't have uh, your main customer base in the US, uh, there could be situations where uh, the decisions for your customers are being made there. So let's take an example that uh, you have a technology for uh, uh, going into a, a mobile phone. Even if the mobile phones are sold to customers around the world, the entry point to the value chain is, is maybe through um, decisions made about the software at, in Cupertino at Apple or something like that. So, so partners being gate uh, keepers and gateways to entering the value chain. Um, so I think, I think uh, these are the only real good answers as to why you should be entering the US. And I think the dominant first one is generic for US and any market. You should be where your customers are. So more to, towards the how, and this is where it gets to be very difficult to be specific because it depends on your circumstances. But the generic view I have on entering the US market is that it's, it's somewhat different from uh, the Norwegian market or the Swedish market in that uh, it might from the outside appear to be a large homogeneous market, but it's only a semi-homogeneous market. Uh, geographically, it's uh, as big or bigger than Europe, as uh, shown by this, this uh, graph here. But it's also, even if it's a, a, a large market where everyone speaks English and has the same federal laws, there are local laws and the industry structures are very different and the consumers behave differently in this market. So uh, being uh, aware of the heterogeneous elements of the US market is very important to be successful in, uh, in the entry. Um, the fact that it's uh, huge, a huge market uh, seems attract attractive, but it also makes it super competitive. Everyone else sees that. Um, and uh, and uh, therefore, um, given that you have that heterogeneity and high competitiveness, I think more in the US market than any other market, it's important to be super focused. And that means being very clear on a much smaller segment of the market than you would in, uh, do like in your home market and try to serve that really well. So that could be vertically or a subset of vertical, or it could be a geographic. I think if you try to say, well, I'm going to win the US market, you're trying to boil the ocean and you're almost certain to fail. And in the cases I've seen, that is as a recipe for failure. Rather saying this specific uh, market, my solution is better and more unique than any other. Let's drill down on that and be very successful there. And, um, uh, and, uh, and that's a basis for building something bigger by expanding. So I think the general learning I've had from, from all my years over in, in the US is, is this uh, super focused approach. Secondarily, for any market, the, the uh, sort of size of ambition is set by the overall market size. And even if you have to be super focused uh, to get attention uh, from investors like uh, ourselves or US investors, or even for customers, uh, you have to, to show ambition uh, framed in the right uh, size of the market. 
And uh, so particularly when we see the startups in Silicon Valley versus the ones we, we see at home, uh, that framing is different. And I think it's important to, to get that right. And secondarily, because of the size and the competitiveness of the market, even if you're so super focused, the resource requirement for succeeding in the US is very high. Um, and planning for that and getting it right is a critical success uh, criteria. So, so what, what does that mean? Well, I, I think it's very important to understand those dynamics and spending time on getting it right before you jump in. And that means having a plan, but even having a plan that should be stress tested and validated uh, before you put real re resources in uh, and adjust accordingly. Being aware of the fact that the US is not uh, just uh, 35 times bigger than Sweden, uh, uh, but it, it has the different uh, characteristics and, and adjusting your playbook rather than trying to, to resource the playbook to a bigger market. And secondarily, or, or thirdly, if, if you need to uh, enter the market by being physically present, I mean, there are businesses where you can acquire customers online and serve them from a European base, that is a simpler exercise. If you have to be on the ground, you should be highly aware of the gap. And the gap being that hiring local people and, um, and uh, managing that relationship remotely, uh, I have yet to see working well. Building one team in two locations are just really hard but it's still critical for success. And that typically means transplanting somebody who represents the culture and the company into the US market and being uh, a resource for uh, building the bridge. So it's two parts of one team, not two teams running in, in opposite directions. These I think are somewhat generic learnings we have. I think the more tactical and specific is very company specific. I would urge you to check out uh, Index Ventures. They have a playbook for US market entry where they essentially map out a range of different uh, company types and different models for market entry. And I think that is a very good framework for, uh, for looking into how to enter the UK, US market for different kinds of companies companies. Okay, if, um, a last point is around uh, raising capital in Silicon Valley or, or on the US West Coast. This is, uh, if you look at the graph here, it's clear that most of the venture capital in the world is sort of uh, congregated in the Bay Area. So an easy uh, thought is that, well, this is where all the venture capital is. Let's go there and raise money because we're a good company and when there's all this capital, uh, that would be a logical way to go about it. Well, once again, in reality, it's also the most competitive place to raise money. And I would say fundraising in Silicon Valley is sort of fundraising uh, Olympics or Olympics for startups. So um, generally that is a, a recipe that, that doesn't work quite so well. So the, the models that I've seen working for, for raising money in the US and particularly on the West Coast, the West Coast is one out of four tracks. Um, one is the accelerator track where Y Combinator is the most obvious example where you spend uh, three to six months uh, becoming an insider and getting on the rails uh, for being an Olympic champion as an insider. That has worked um, repeatedly for companies, particularly on the Y Combinator track. Of course, the one question is, are you a company that fit that model and will you get selected to be in Y Combinator or a similar high quality accelerator? But it's definitely a track that works. <clears throat> uh, being a great company is not a way to, uh, it in itself is not a way to raise interest with investors over there. However, if you're a company that is world-class in something very narrow and specialized, uh, say some kind of technology or, or something like that, the US investor market is much more specialized than any other market. So say you are 
uh, a world class in very, a very specific area, I think there is an opportunity to address angel investors or venture capital investors that cover only specific that very narrow area and specialized area. And that has worked, but that is uh, not the generic uh, approach that uh, there's lots of capital in the market and we're a good company. Finally, the, uh, uh, or the, the second one is clearly that uh, find a way to fund your way and build a great business in the US market. And once you're a successful company in the market, after you built the bridge, um, uh, you are an insider and you're, you're being viewed as a local company and already as a winner. The drawback to that method is, of course, that you need to uh, raise a lot of money in the first place to build that bridge and become successful. And the last one is essentially become super successful in your home market, being Sweden or Europe or whatever it is. Um, uh, US investment is come, becoming global and we see the best companies in Europe attract interest and particularly now during the pandemic from the US and globally that they didn't happen two years ago. So I think those are the, the sort of the tracks to attract US capital. Great, thanks so much Arne. There's Arne's contact information. Um, we're running a little bit behind on the agenda, so I just wanted to kind of keep keep things moving if possible. But I think Arne's perspective as an investor is quite unique and quite different from some of the testimonials that we've heard. But there were some points that overlapped as well. So I think we're getting some really good information here. And if Arne is going to stick around, maybe we, we did have a question, but I think we'll need to pass on that right now and move on to our next group. But if Arne is going to stick around, maybe we can get him, catch up to him at the, at the end of the wrap-up session. So the next group we have is called the West Coast Market Team. And there are two panel experts on uh, who are going to be presenting to us. The first who will be presenting is Matt's Anderson. He's from the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco. So Emma's colleague just separated by about 3,000 miles or so. And then we also have Jenny Nordler, who is the project manager for the Prince Daniels Fellowship at the Nordic Innovation House in Silicon Valley, Palo Alto more specific, which is kind of where it all began. But Mats is going to start the, the this session by talking a little bit about Swedish American Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco. Welcome, Mats. So thanks, Neil, for having me here and a pleasure to be here. My name is, is Mats Andersson and I'm executive director of the Swedish American Chamber here in uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. I grew up in Stockholm and uh, spent uh, 25 years in Stockholm and then I've been two decades down in Central Europe uh, leading mainly engineer teams and I came here to the US like one and a half year ago. And uh, before take, talking about what we can, what we're doing at the chamber, and uh, what we can do for you, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, very special West Coast uh, atmosphere. And it, it's difficult to, without living it, it, it. You can have it explained to you, but without living it, it's difficult to understand. But there is something here that transpires from society and also in the tech scene, and it's this uh, thing of giving to the community. So. People always try to give and uh, share knowledge, and in in a way that you give somewhere and you get back from somewhere else. And this creates this fantastic uh, ecosystem. I think it's especially present here in uh, in Northern California, around San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, it, it's something really amazing that creates a, a fantastic uh, ecosystem, and I think that is part of the success of the. Of, of the West Coast in the US that you have this as so you, you get IDs from somewhere else. People are not afraid of sharing IDs and uh, you receive back somewhere else in the chain. It, it is uh, truly amazing. And this coupled with that, everyone is talking to each other all the time, everywhere. You can always uh, talk to someone and exchange. And that, that is, it, it is really something fabulous to, to live. Um, and I think we at the chamber here, we, we incarnate that. We are a smaller player than uh, Business Sweden and, uh, and Vinova with Nordic Innovation House. We have no uh, state subsidies, but we, um, so we, we uh, survive on our memberships and well, the value we're giving to the members and also events we are creating. And uh, before Christmas, I was uh, 
talking to a lot of uh, science parks in in Sweden because I had the idea of doing a pitch event and then I I, I had this really feeling that there is such a need to uh, have a yeah, really build a bridge with Sweden and have these connections and I also noticed uh, even if uh, it's amazing how many startups you have now in Sweden when I grew up nobody started companies now everyone seems to do so I think that is it, it's amazing to see but I also had this when we talked to science parks in um, in North Sweden they said that their target was to get their companies to Stockholm and I was thinking we, you, sh- you could go directly to the US you don't have to pass by a Stockholm so so we have created um, uh, a, a startup pack now that we're going to roll out here in the in the spring that is dedicated to Swedish companies and we want to help to it could be a company who is on the way to the US now or has a view on the US in in, in a couple of years so uh, let me see I'll share a little bit this slide here and um, so we call it kickstart USA and what we want to do is to get you into the network at an early stage uh, so we have created a, a, a uh, go to market puzzle covered and a, a very comprehensive startup package and this is coupled with uh, q and a's uh, and being uh, in the networks you can talk to these people who are who are who you need to to get into to to the us or also just build the connection or build your network because when you are in this ecosystem where you give and receive you need to have the network, so you need to to get into it somehow. And it's obviously it's more difficult when you are on the other side of the ocean, but it it, it can be done. Huh? So um, we can skip that. And so what we want to do is a comprehensive playbook. So where if people joining in with the chamber, comprehensive playbook where you get access to our. Uh, information about the legal aspect, which is so important. We heard it from the other speakers, you, CPA, you need uh, bookkeeping, you need tax accountants, you need to know how this works. It's also different from state to state. As uh, previous speakers mentioned, it's not a uh, homogeneous market. Access to venture capitalists, you need HR, you need to know h- how to handle that. You need the banking information, all these small pieces that um, if you have a lot of money, it's probably not a problem. You pay someone to take care of that. But if you want to know, the, if you're a startup and you want to enter, you need to have a view on this. And it can easily become very expensive if you don't um, research it beforehand. So we'll give you a very comprehensive playbook in the beginning that you can read through. And then we're going to couple this with a webinar series dedicated to, to, to small groups where you can meet these experts and uh, in an informal environment, do Q&A sessions and get their expertise. And also you'll, you'll get access to, to our network and us at the chamber. So we really hope to see uh, this continuous bridge being built between us and the, um, the, the Swedish startup scene. Because I, I think that here the pandemic has helped this before it was much for, more formal that you had a delegation coming to San Francisco and it was planned six months ahead. And, but now you can have this continuous dialogue and, and uh, when things are opening up, you can of course meet again, it's always better. Uh, but I, I, I really hope that um, we get in touch as, as many as you as possible in the in, on the Swedish startup scene, if it's just for a chat. So I'm going to share my, um, uh, you can contact me or my colleague Ronja, and I'm going to share in the chat my LinkedIn. I think the LinkedIn is the easiest to connect or, or, or the mail. Uh, and uh, so thank you very much. And... Uh, Good luck with your companies. Okay, thank you so much, Mats. We'll, without further ado, we'll just move right over to Jenny. We know we're running a few minutes late on our agenda. We hope that you'll bear with us and stick with us to the end. I don't really want to interrupt anybody. The information is so good. So hopefully we'll be able to wrap up by 10 after five, the latest, we promise. But please welcome Jenny Nordlow from the Nordic Innovation House in Silicon Valley. Thank you so much and and thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, So my name is Jenny and I'm representing the Nordic Innovation House in Silicon Valley. And I will actually share my screen with you. Uh, Let me see. Seems like it's working. 
Um, so I will speak just briefly about the Nordic Innovation House and uh, inform you about a few opportunities that I think can be interesting for you as startup founders. So let's see. So the Nordic Innovation House, um, it's a collaboration between the Nordic countries, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Finland, and Denmark. And we bridge the Nordics with the main innovation hotspots around the world. We have offices in Silicon Valley. I'm based in downtown Palo Alto. And we also have offices in Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and New York. And we have approximately 160 members from startups uh, to corporations. And I wish I could say that everyone was on site right now, but uh, because of the pandemic, um, uh, we don't have any companies in the office at the moment, but hopefully we will have that uh, in the fall. Um, so what can Nordic Innovation House do for you as a founder? Well, if you have plans to establish in the US, uh, I would say the Nordic Innovation House is a great and cost-effective soft landing spot. Um, the membership target companies which are looking to commit further to the Bay Area, join networks, meet clients, potential investors, etc. And, but it's also for you who, who would like to have a physical working space in Silicon Valley. You can rent a desk uh, at our office or you can uh, become a virtual member. It all depends on your own needs. And also um, I would like to highlight some of our incubator programs. As Arne said before, uh, in order to become an insider, joining an accelerator is actually a great way. And we have, two uh, accelerator programs that could be of interest. The first name, the first is called Tink and the other one is REIT. Um, I will speak about them in a minute. I also wanna mention the Nordic Women in Tech Initiative, which we are running at the moment. Um, if you are a woman running a technology company, that could actually be of interest for you because you can find mentors and role models in Silicon Valley will match you with, with a network here. Uh, we don't have an application open at the moment, but we will have uh, this fall. So keep an eye out on our website. Uh, but over to our incubator program um, called Tink. And uh, um, I would describe it as a four week long crash course in the Silicon Valley mindset. Uh, the program workshops will run uh, during four weeks and uh, three days a week. So you have to be committed if you apply to this program. So you will have joint sessions with other uh, companies from the Nordics, but you will also have one-to-one -one sessions with our mentors and coaches at the Nordic Innovation House. And I would say that the target group for, for Tink um, is companies that want to build a network in Silicon Valley, learn how to find business partners or investors. Um, and if, you're in, if you have a product, but you're unsure if you have the right product market fit, I think this program could be actually great for you. And it's actually for programs of all sizes. So you, you can be like a newly started company, but you have to have basic funding in place. Uh, you can also be a, a scale up. Uh, I think the most important thing that we are looking at is, is the entrepreneurial te team behind the company. Um, so the application is open right now. You can apply today on our website. The deadline is March 15. So it's a great way if you want to expand to Silicon Valley. And if you're a research-based company, we have um, a program called REACH. Um, it's similar to Tink, but it's a six month long program and it's for companies that are research-based. It can be a, a research project, uh, or a research startup. And we will open the application uh, this fall. So that was just a few words about the Nordic Innovation House and also about some opportunities that you could uh, apply, apply to. Thank you so much, that was it for me. Jenny, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure that between your presentation and the information that Charles gave us earlier, people have a much better understanding of what Nordic Innovation House is and what it can do for startups looking to enter the American market. 
Our final session of the day before we wrap things up is another testimonial. This is a testimonial from a company called Look Back. And we have with us May Rowan, who is the CFO at Look Back. She's going to share her, the uh, Look Back's experience in entering the US market. Now, Look Back was started as a spinoff from Spotify based on Spotify's need to understand and collaborate around the user experience of their mobile phones. Look Back was founded in 2013 and relocated to Silicon Valley in 2015. Please welcome May. Hi, uh, my name is uh, May Rowan. Uh, I'm the CFO uh, at Look Back, uh, but I also had a journey uh, before coming into Look Back. I, um, uh, I can go to the next one. So uh, Look Back, uh, we had a quick intro there. Uh, I've been in the US for about 10 years. Uh, I came here with uh, actually my husband's company, uh, Icentio, uh, a, a bioinformatics startup uh, from Norway, uh, where we kind of tried to get into the market here and uh, uh, did the whole, whole route. We were able to uh, restart it and get funding here. And I'm uh, still part of uh, the founding team there. Uh, however, I also uh, worked as a, uh, uh, with finance operation for a lot of uh, companies here as a, a finance operation um, uh, consultant uh, that helped me really to learn uh, what was needed uh, to go into the U.S. market. I felt in the beginning it was a lot of learning. <laughs> it's a pretty uh, intense uh, journey to to go to the US and and kind of leave everything behind and, and try to make it work uh, after working as a contractor uh, for several startups here in the US uh, mostly with international aspects I uh, worked uh, also in two local uh, startups here in Santa Cruz uh, where I'm located uh, and then I found my way to look back and that was like feeling a bit coming home I've been there for three years now and kind of coming back to the Nordic and having a team here in the US and also having a team in uh, the Nordic, but also growing a team international. Uh, I tried to put a map here where you can see where we have people. We have quite a few here in the US, but we also have um, a very remote team all over the world. Uh, when it's not a pandemic, <laughs> we typically go on retreats where we can really be close together, talk, and uh, kind of get to know each other. Uh, we work mostly remote, so kind of having that connection is important. And now with the pandemic, it's a bit harder. So as you can see here on the lower picture, we do remote retreats. It's not the same, but uh, it, it, it will do for uh, 2020, and hopefully we can go back to the normal retreats. So. Uh, I'm trying to tell a bit about my goal with this was to try to see what can I tell you that I wish I knew before going here. Uh, it's been a, an intense journey uh, and kind of giving some pointers to, to what to think about and what to prepare about uh, was my goal with this. I've broken it into three parts, resources, relations, and roots. So let me dive in there. Uh, so resources, uh, uh, for me, kind of uh, the three buckets there are team, cash, and equity. The team, uh, I know that everybody says that uh, kind of having the, the, the best team and uh, investors are investor in teams and not ideas and, and team, but what is a great team? Uh, and I think that the great team, it is about having complementary knowledge and also know the industry you're going into and have uh, the technology knowledge uh, in, in the founding team is important. Um, and also be able to see that you will actually spend the next five to 10 years with these people. The core team, uh, the co-founders, the key team need to kind of do this journey together and need to be aligned. Uh, I've been in a lot uh, of companies, as I said, uh, especially working as a finance operation uh, um, contractor. I, I worked with more than 40 different companies, uh, a lot of them with international uh, um, entities. And uh, one of the challenges was that uh, 
to, to be able to make that bridge and actually kind of have a unity and, and be able to grow here in the US uh, and still kind of maintain that um, team uh, locally. Uh, that's always important. So kind of having, having that um, team in place where, where, where you really know uh, to do this together. And sometimes it doesn't work out, but then you have to have those great agreements in place and know what to do if things doesn't work out. So kind of thinking really hard about the team that you have going into the US market, I think it's one of the, uh, the really important things. The other thing is cash, cash is king. <laughs> it's a, uh, you can grow, you can get customers, you can do all of that stuff, but if you run out of cash, and you can't fundraise or you, you can't get paid, you, you, you have to shut down. And I've been uh, sad to see a lot of great companies having shutting down and, uh, and very often because of the cash. Uh, and kind of planning, planning the situation, planning the next step, planning the financing, not only the next financing, but thinking really through like, how do you get to the different milestones and what are the different milestones and doing that research on like what what does it take to go from series C to series A or what what do you need to achieve to go to the next level and how much cash will that actually uh, need to get you there? Uh, the cash is the lifeline and um, uh, that's uh, and especially maybe as a CFO that's uh, even more my job to make sure that we don't run out of cash. Uh, in look back. We've been very fortunate since 2018, we've been cash flow even. That's is very unique. Uh, we're, we feel very good about that. Uh, we're growing a bit slower, but we really, we really use kind of the, the customer's money to grow. And uh, we have had investors and we have them and uh, we like them, but we also really enjoy having uh, kind of the ability to grow with customers and, and, and really use that as our main resource. The other thing is, is equity. Um, that is a challenge. I have been working uh, a lot with Nordic companies and here in the US having option plans in place is key to grow the team. Uh, it's a bit harder in the Nordic and when you then have some people in the Nordic and some people here in the US, finding that middle ground and be able to, to use equity and use kind of uh, that the, actually the employees have a stake in the company and really want to stick out and really kind of go through those hard times where, where you're low on cash, where you have to delay payroll, where you have to uh, kind of really kind of stay together and, and, and go and power through. Uh, kind of having uh, employees with stock options uh, is important, especially here in the US. Uh, we're working a lot with that uh, in look back at the moment to make sure that we have good plans. And I feel like there are things happening in the Nordic that will make this better going forward. Uh, but it is quite hard uh, to find good solutions right now. Um, and, and I think one of the really nice things about Silicon Valley and this area and is that it's actually the engineers, the, the technical people, the, the knowledge that, that owns a lot of the companies. And so they stick it out and they, they'll, they'll be there. They just don't look for the next opportunity when it's getting hard. They actually, uh, they really kind of invested in the company uh, the same way as a founding team is. So finding, using that equity as an opportunity to get great people and, and build the company is really important. Uh, I know when we got here with Icentio uh, at that time, we had a, a challenging cap table uh, because we had so many uh, Norwegian owners and, and we got a lot of pushback for that. So um, I don't say that that was the only <laughs> reason why we were not able to, to raise uh, in the beginning, but uh, that is, uh, it's a challenge. And look back, we were able to do um, a flip. So we changed kind of the parent company to be in the US and we're able to structure it in new ways so that our US investor, uh, it was more normal and we had an option pool and, and we had those more uh, kind of streamlined um, agreements in place. And, and it will look more like a US company 
uh, after that. So, uh, but thinking through those things, the team, the cash and the, the equity. Uh, so those resources before coming here and, and planning uh, as good as you can, there will always be things that doesn't go out after plan, but having that plan is really important and then revisiting it. So the next thing uh, I wanted to touch upon is relations. And it is hard. It is hard to be in the Nordic uh, and then growing here in the in the US. Uh, we definitely have felt it in Look Back. Uh, we feel we're getting better. Uh, but we definitely had some uh, experience where we hired uh, salespeople and uh, we were growing and it, it got a really stretched in the team. Uh, what we learned is that uh, uh, the network, um, and, and you can call relation network, but network seems to be a bit of a buzzword, but I think the network is more kind of that grindy, knowing people, knowing over years and actually really trusting them. Uh, I feel one of the, the really learnings I have is that a lot of the US people I know, they do people with people they trust in their network and they where they can do good references. Uh, I was at a talk with Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix uh, yesterday actually. And and he, he, just, he was very plain. He never, he never hired people that he can't check references for. And, and that's how a lot of uh, US business is done. Uh, so being part of the network and having people here and growing your network and giving back, like we heard earlier, uh, is, is really key to, to attract the good people and keep the good people and be able to grow. So I can say that one of the, the key people we have in, in Look Back, uh, all of the key people we hired here in the US is people we've known for years uh, and they know look back and they know what they're going into and they plug in and they, 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 can, they can go very quickly. So kind of having this whole idea of, of giving back, kind of really getting good relationships if you wanna grow here is important. Uh, also partners, I think uh, one of the things that surprised me a bit in the beginning is that uh, people actually also buy from the people within their network. Uh, and uh, very often the couple of first sales are very people depending. It's uh, people taking risk on other people and kind of having those relationships and be able to close those first sales, get those first happy customers is so key uh, in the new market. And um, and I, and I think I, I realized that working with, I worked with a lot of Israeli companies and, and they really used their network. Um, if they had somebody in Cisco working that was Israeli, they could go straight to them. The same I see we could do for the Nordic. Like we, we need to also leverage the network just outside the startups, but also with people living here and, and be able to kind of do the buying and helping with uh, the legal aspects and, and be the vendor. And so it's, it's uh, kind of building those relationships with partners. I think it is hard from a distance. You have to be here and you have to uh, invest in uh, growing that partnership. Uh, and then the last one is financing. Uh, uh, I remember coming to the US and, and looking at those graphs and of course, here, this is where the money is. This is where you raise money. Uh, but <coughs> it is about relations. Uh, most investors know the <laughs> what they're investing in for a long time, and they know what they're looking for, and they know what kind of team they're looking for. And they very often do reference checks. I have been in several companies. I can say that look back when we received the funding, it was, that's uh, the middle picture here. It's a uh, it was Nevin, one of the co-founders sitting on the bus, talking to the guy next to him and turned out that was an investor. They started meeting up and after, after a month, they actually went into business together. The same with, uh, with Icentio. Uh, I met uh, the investor that we have, our angel investor, when I was a judge at the hackathon for the local university here. And he was sitting next to me. We started talking and 
and and he got interested in the technology that we had and and he invested so uh, it seems easy but it is uh, it takes time and it takes trust and uh, getting financing here uh, or investor takes time and 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 building those relations uh, the last thing I wanted to, to touch upon that I think we sometimes forget is uh, the roots. And I think now when I've been here for 10 years, kind of trying to look back and see what is it that we have from the Nordic that we can actually use here in the US that give us leverage and advantage so that we can involve. And I think uh, kind of the leverage uh, Nordic Innovation House and and all of the, the, the Nordic people living here, uh, we, we can help each other. And I think that gives us that leverage that we need to, to, to build kind of that community larger. And I think uh, the whole, I know I've seen a lot of structure where we keep a team in the Nordic. We have an uh, R&D. Engineers in the Nordic are, are very um, strong technical knowledge and they're more um, um, they have more reason to stay in a Nordic uh, than a U.S. Uh, company. Here in the here in Palo Alto, um, engineers are very um, they they move along. They move along if they have a, a great opportunity. If they're not kind of having too much equity, and they will go to the next company. And kind of having that trust and having that team and and kind of building that R and D and engineering in the local market, I've seen several uh, companies do very successfully. So using the leverage and using the roots and using those connections, uh, both uh, here and, and in, in other markets and also at home. And uh, I will try to wrap it up. I know I'm going a bit over time here, but uh, I also just wanted to touch on um, some of the, the advantages that, that are in the Nordic that we, uh, especially in the beginning can forget about is like the free healthcare, the, the education, the um, the, it's lower salaries in, in the Nordic. And the reason is quite honest, the, the, all the additional healthcare, the school, the, the security and all of that, but that can be used in a good way uh, if you wanna build a company uh, to, to, as long as you make it fair. And, and that is one, one of the things that we've been really focusing on here is like, how can we bring some of that good things from the Nordic to, to look back and to the culture here. And one of the things that we've done is done uh, something that we call the Nordic 40 plus PTO. And it's an unlim unlimited uh, PTO or, or vacation, uh, but we hire great people. So if they need to take a rest, they, they, they do that. If they are sick, they can take the day off. If they need a vacation, they do that. Uh, but here in the U.S., it's it's very it's very limited vacation time, and having this Nordic forty plus, where we say forty days, is actually what we will assume that you will take during the year, and uh, that sets the expectation of what we want people to do. Uh, and I think kind of taking taking that, we see that we can attract more U.S. people as long as we match that with, of course, results and follow up and, and, and all of these things. So, and FICA, we brought FICA into our company. We always have FICA when we go to, to retreats. And, and so kind of having those small kind of uh, 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 local things with, with us when we, we actually go out in the world is, is something that can be stronger. Uh, and I think it will be evolved. Interrupt. Yeah. And ask I you will to, uh, just... stop there. <laughs> that was my summary. Thank yeah. Thank you so much for for the for, for the informative presentation. And we see three uh, testimonials today from three very different companies. They've had um, similar experiences, but quite different uh, on their on their path as well. Um, Jessica, I know you asked two really good questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to answer them today. We can try to follow up with the panelists to get them to answer it, and we can include it in an email to those who have registered. If you haven't registered, you can reach out to us at info at adion.se, and we can try to get you onto the list onto the list as well. The, the, the questions were regarding how do you approach an investor and about visas to be able to 
go to the United States, as Arna was saying, make sure that you have a team in the United States as well. So if I could just take a couple of minutes to to wrap it up, we, we've heard we've heard from a, a wide range of people, both in the innovation ecosystems, investors and people who have been a part of companies journeys into the U.S. market. And I think there were some key points that came up that I just wanted to cover here. So early on, we talked about uh, the the difference between a pitch deck and a presentation. If you're not sure what they are, reach out to the organizations who are on today's call. As I said before, I know that Business Sweden helps companies in Sweden make sure that they have really solid pitch decks. Be prepared, right? Focus, focus, focus was, was Johan's message. He used a, they used a CRM system to make sure that they could accomplish that. Choose the right partners. I, I wrote here, if needed, I think that the general message was that partners are needed in the US market. Make sure that you choose the right ones. How you do that, of course, is going to vary, but you can make sure that you vet them, ask them questions. There are state and federal laws. Some of them could be quite different. It could be quite confusing. So yes, get yourself legal help. Make sure that you understand the difference in and the laws depending on what branch you're going into and where you're actually going to be doing businesses. Um, what's your why? Um, Arna might, might be a fan of, of Simon Sinek, which is start with the why. Why are you going into the U.S. market? And if you don't have a solid answer, you might want to think about um, the difficulties in going in so if you don't have a solid why. Uh, more specific um, to enter the, as opposed to just saying enter the U.S. market, is you need to be more specific on that and be make sure that you understand exactly, let's say, what part of the market or what branch. Be focused. Again, Arna, Arna said that. Transplant a team member. Have the culture from your home base transplanted into the United States. Um, be great in a niche. Don't be just okay in a really wide range, but be great in a niche and conquer your home market first. That always makes it easier, especially from an investor's point of view. And then finally, I, I, would, I, would, like, I would definitely agree with this, is network. Your network is super important. Um, you heard May talk about that they hire people from their network. They buy from their network. They hang out with people to expand their network. They go to different um, events and activities. So build your network. Don't be afraid to talk to people. People, increase your breadth and make sure that you have as wide a network as possible to enter the U.S. market and to do it really well. I lied a little bit. We ended at 1711, but we still have 17 attendees on here. So I want to thank you all for your time. Of course, I want to thank our nine panelists for taking their time to spread their knowledge and experience with you all. Um, especially those out on the West Coast who got up super early to be with us today. We do greatly appreciate it, and we are sure that the attendees today appreciated it as well. We'll be following up to the people who have signed up on the, uh, uh, for, for the event with a link to the recording of the event, so you'll be able to see the presentations again, et cetera, et cetera, and we will reach out to the panelists to get answers to those questions. Thank you all. That's it from me from a DN Science Park in Lund, and we hope to see you at another event sometime in the future.